Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in welcoming Dr. Maria Clave. So it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I think this is my first visit ever to NC State. So, um, and I just want to thank Blair for being an amazing uh, organizer and for persuading me that I really had to come do this. And I am having a fantastic time. So the first question is, why should we care about broadening participation in computing? And, um, and also just mention, I'm, I have, I've illustrated my talk with some of my paintings um, because I try to be, uh, I hid the fact that I painted until I turned 40 years old because I felt it was so weird already being the first woman in my job for so many years that if I, people knew I was an artist, I'd be even less respected. But after I turned the, on my 40th birthday, I started, I framed my paintings and hung them both in the department head's office and, and in my home. And now I always talk about the fact that I'm an artist because I think whether you're female or you are an athlete or you're a person of color or you're gay or lesbian, trans, whatever, it really shouldn't matter in terms of you're being encouraged to participate in any discipline. And um, so this particular painting uh, is because my daughter, Sasha, who's now 32, um, said to me about 10 years ago, she says, Mom, my best friend, Colleen, she just bought this antique map, and it's really gorgeous, and I can't afford to buy one, so why wouldn't you paint one for me? And I'm going, uh, it'd be a lot faster to just give her $200 to go buy one. But anyhow, this is, this is known as Sasha's world. Sasha, I'm very proud of both of my kids, but Sasha is just starting as the United Nations lead for the peace process in the Central African Republic. Okay, what does it matter? First of all, we don't come close to meeting the demand for computer science grads today in the US. We're meeting about ha half of the demand, but that demand is gonna get way more intense in the next decade or so. Also, these are fantastic jobs. They pay well. Uh, they offer a lot of flexibility if you're interested in combining a career, an ambitious career with having a family. Uh, you can do them from almost anywhere. So if you are in a relationship and both of you need to find work in a, the same geographic area, it helps. Um, and you're working on important problems, which is the third reason why broadening participation is really important because we know that diverse teams do a better job of finding solutions to difficult problems. In every problem that faces the world today, it's not it's going to be the, they're going to be solved by computer science alone. They're going to be solved by people who can come together in interdisciplinary teams that can work together on these problems, but computer science is going to be part of it. And then the last one is because we need to get way better in figuring out how to train people who've had a career and are in their 40s or their 30s or their 50s or 60s because automation, robotics, it's going to transform every aspect of society. And if we, we don't know how to make it possible for people to learn this knowledge, not just young people and not just people of every race and gender and sexual orientation, faith, etc., our world and I don't mean just the United States, our world is not going to do well. And to make these changes, there's change needed at every point in the pipeline. So for example, and we have people here, like Professor Barnes, who works on increasing access to computer science to everyone, so CS for all. We need to dramatically increase the diversity, particularly women and people of color, and inclusion, because it's not enough just to get people in the door. You actually need to make sure that the experience they have is supportive, welcoming, engaging, et cetera. 
we need to do so even more so in the tech industry. We need to increase uh, the diversity and inclusion of faculty in academia. And I just want to say uh, NC State University is number one, I believe, probably in the world right now in terms of having 22 female faculty. Yes! But we also need to make sure that when we look at the highest levels of leadership, whether it's in industry or academia, we see women and people of color, uh, people of color well represented. And so I have a hypothesis how to get all of this done. It's a very simple hypothesis. And it's that if we, number one, make our environments, learning environments and work environments, engaging and supportive for everyone, if we build confidence and community among our women and people of color, and perhaps the most important one is we, if we demystify the path to success, then women and people of color will come, thrive, and stay. Now, that third one, one of the things that happens that if you are, say, one of a small number of women or a small number of black people in a particular major or in a work environment, you don't even know the information that you are failing to get access to that is being shared with members of the dominant group because you're not going out to the various events, whether it's for executive, it's, if it's on the golf course, or you know, for young people, it's you know, hanging out at a cafe or, or restaurant. You're not there, and you don't find out the information that other people are getting access to and you don't know that you don't have it, and they don't know that you don't have it. They don't even, the people who are getting access, they don't even realize that they have a disproportionate level of access. So this bit about really explaining very clearly to everyone about what it takes to be successful in a CS major, as a graduate student, as a young person professional in the tech industry, as a more senior leader in the tech industry, we've got to get much better at doing that. Okay, so what could we do? Well, we could, for example, provide fun and interesting courses like the joy and beauty of computing in K-12. We could change the way we teach computer science at the college level. We could learn how to recruit and retain more diverse faculty. We could learn how to recruit and retain more diverse professionals in the tech industry. We could create networking and mentoring opportunities for diverse professionals at all levels. And we could increase the visibility of the issue. Now, I really have to thank Harvey Weinstein and Roy Moore and even poor Al Franken because there's no question and Justin Calderbeck, something like that from Binary Capital. I mean, there's just no question that in, and you know, Uber for that matter, in the last 12 months, we have seen more attention to harassment and discrimination than we have seen in the past two decades. And I am so tired of being the person in the room where a list of names of people who are being proposed for some honor, so let's say, to be the plenary speaker or to be a participant in this special initiative. And there's 40 names, and how many women are there? Could be zero, could be one, could be three. But unless the organizer is a female, it will not be more than that. And I'm tired of being the person who says, so why aren't there, why are there only two women's names there? And the answer is always the same. Oh, because there really aren't any women with this level of sort of seniority or fame or whatever. Well, I always come equipped with a list of, let's say, 25 women that I could propose at this particular thing. But it gets really tiring. So, you know, it would be really nice if everybody were increasing the visibility of these issues. And then, of course, is this question. Um, you know, if we're going to get more women and people of color into senior leadership positions, we've got to actually have those people at the early stages of their careers actually being saying, yeah, I want, I want a leadership role. I want to take this on. And we have to provide more support for everybody who's doing that. So did you know 
that computer science is the only STEM discipline where the female percentage of majors has declined in the last 30 years from more than 35%, typically in the mid-30s, to less than 15%. It's the only discipline. So if I look at my own you know, initial discipline mathematics, um, I was in virtually every class I was in, there were two girls. I was one of the two girls out of maybe whether it was 20 or 50. And yet today, 45% of math majors are female. Physics used to be like 3% female. Today it's like 20 to 22% female. So this one is the only one that went backwards. And when I first started asking about why this might be the case in, you know, maybe the early 1990s, people would say, oh, because it's, you need to be good at math to be in computer science. Well, uh, women do just fine in math. Um, and, you know, the other bizarre thing is that there is no better major in terms of career prospects for the next couple of decades in computer science. And lots of places have actually taken this on and have made progress. So the two earliest ones were Carnegie Mellon and UBC. Um, very different kinds of institutions. UBC think um, basically like a UCLA large research public u university. Um, Carnegie Mellon, smaller, private. Um, but uh, both places did research, and um, UBC, over five-year periods, Carnegie Mellon went from 8% to 38%, UBC from 16 to 27%. Uh, MIT, in the last decade, went from about 20 to 32%. MUD went over a four, well, now an 11-year period from 10% to 15%, but it went from 10% to 40% over a five-year period. Cal Poly Slow went from 12 to 29 percent, UW from 15 to 30 percent, and Stanford from 10 percent to 32 percent. So I, I put this list up. There's probably another half dozen that have made similar kinds of progress. But what's crazy is making these changes is not expensive, it's not difficult, but it requires persistence and a commitment from the department it's not something that one person can do by themselves. Okay, so I'm going to tell you uh, about how, what Harvey Mudd did. And I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Harvey Mudd. Raise your hand if you had heard about Harvey Mudd before today. Now, that's pretty good. Okay, now raise your hand if you hadn't. Yeah, that's pretty good too. So I'll tell you about it just so that you get the context. I'm going to tell you about the work on increasing diversity at Harvey Mudd, and then some specific actions by the computer science department. So Harvey Mudd, tiny. Uh, it did say 831, but I changed to 844 this morning because I just saw the stats. Um, it's a liberal arts college of science and engineering founded in 1955. It was founded as co-ed. This was a disagreement between the trustees and the founding president. Uh, the trustees thought it should be a men's college, and the founding president thought it should be co-ed. And in a discussion about this, um, the, one of the trustees says to the founding president, his name is Joe Platts, physicist, says, who would ever want to marry a female mathematician? And Joe says, I did. It, it was true. <laughs> and so it was co-ed. But um, it really was mostly white and male for a very long time. They even had a cap on the percentage of students who could be female that lasted 11% until 1971. It's one of the five undergraduate Claremont colleges. Claremont is a small town uh, east of LA, about 35 miles east of LA, has five undergraduate colleges, Pomona, Scripps, Claremont McKenna, Harvey Mudd, and Pitzer, and two graduate institutions. The campuses are literally side by side. They make up a jigsaw puzzle. And what is unusual is that the students can and do take courses at any of the undergraduate colleges or the graduate institutions for that matter. And for the most part, there's no money that changes hands. And we were a debtor nation for our entire existence until about two years ago. And we're now, whatever the opposite of, well, I guess we're a donor nation or investor nation or something all because of computer science. And I, I brag about how wonderful our students are. Uh, they're very 
it's true they're very uh, able students, but they're also very hardworking. They collaborate from day one. Our value system is it's every student's job to make sure that every other student succeeds. And our faculty are like that too. So highly collaborative, very intimate, tightly connected community. Okay, so I'm going to give you the stats for women and faculty and students. So uh, when, you know, roughly nine years before I arrived, we were about a bit more than 20% female. Uh, by the time I showed up, we were a bit more than 30% female. Uh, four years later, we were a bit more than 40%. And we're getting closer and closer, and we're finally at, I think, 20, 50% right now. Uh, we've had two classes that came in at more than 50% female. Uh, one entered in uh, 2010, the other entered this year. Uh, in 2010, there was this huge backlash of people saying, you only got in because you're a girl. You don't belong here. And it was because we hadn't admitted more female students, we just increased the yield. And it was an aberration. But that, that group, so they graduated in 2014, they had a terrible first year. I think many of you know about stereotype threat, that if you make students feel like they don't really belong there, they're not going to do as well. And I'm happy to say that we did eventually graduate uh, over 90% of the women that started, but it was a couple of percent less than the men who started that year. So we were very careful not to let it go over 50%, because and this year, we're at 52.5% female incoming class. Not a word. Took time. Oh, faculty, there were about 20% uh, 20 years ago. There were about a third by the time I started. They, we reached about 40% in 2010, and we're still at about 40%. We're actually, technically, we're 39%, because we have 100 faculty, and 39 of them are female. Um, that's a lot for a science and engineering school. And when I started as president, so uh, Provost Arden mentioned that I was the first female to be president, um, there had been two instances that there had been a female department chair in the 50 years before I got there. And this year, five of the seven academic departments chairs are female. And every single one of those five is the first female to chair the department. And it's not because we did anything special. We have done tons of diversity and inclusion programming throughout the college for our faculty, for our staff, for our students, for our board. And we've done lots of training of search committees for uh, faculty searches. But we didn't do anything in particular about choosing department chairs. But I think that all the other work we've done, it just, uh, it was just the best candidates turned out to be women. And last year, it was six of the seven department chairs. The reason it's only five now is because the, we, for the very first time, our dean of the faculty, who is our provost equivalent, is a female, Lisa Sullivan. And she was department chair before she came out. OK. Uh, so let's just say gender is easy, race is hard. And particularly, race is very hard in this country because of the history. And so we had been working uh, on trying to recruit more students of color long before I came to Harvey Mudd. And we were running at between 1% and 2% African uh, black, including African students from Africa and biracial students. And we suddenly had some success in 2013, which continued to 2014. And then we had another remarkable step of success in 2015 that has continued through to now. So now our incoming classes for the last three years have been roughly 10% black. For his Latinx or Hispanic, we were at roughly 5% um, in 2012. And our income classes have been at least 20% for the last three years in a row. Native American Pacific Islander, about 1%, now to about 3%. International, we've stayed steady at about 10%. Asian American, we've been stable at between 20 and 25%. And Caucasian, obviously, something is going down 
Caucasian has been decreasing. Well, what about faculty? Well, there's a difference between students and faculty. So students graduate in four, perhaps five or six years. So student numbers can change fairly rapidly. Our faculty members tend to stay for 35 years or longer. We have one faculty member who's in his 48th year at this point. He's also in the founding class. Um, so I'd say it's much slower. I mean, we typically we are, uh, you know, hiring four, five, or six new faculty a year. Um, we have made progress. So we have gone from being one black faculty member to now being at four. We've gone from being, you know, maybe three Hispanic faculty members to now being at six. But it's definitely slow. And the one thing, there's two things we found that are really important. One is educating every search committee every year. Because what we find is as soon as we take our eye off the ball, oops, sorry. As soon as we stop paying attention, the progress stops. And, and so we had one year where we ended up with five out of the six people being hired were white males. And the other person was an Asian male. So I, I think the thing that's just really important is you have to be thinking about it. And, and it can't be something you just do one year at a time. You actually need to build relationships. If you really are going to attract the top black and Latinx uh, young faculty members, you need to build a relationship with them while they are PhD students and postdocs. And you know, really having them get to know you, having you get to know them, et cetera. So now let me move on to what our computer science department did. OK, number one, they changed the intro course. So I will tell you in detail about what they did. But oh my goodness, at Harvey Mudd, every student has to take a computer science course in the first semester. They also have to take a math course, a physics course, a chemistry course, uh, a writing course, et cetera. So it's not that computer science is different. And they're going to, you know, in their second semester, they're going to take a biology course. And in the third semester, they're going to take an engineering course. And they're all taking those. So we have the opportunity to, every computer science department has the opportunity to make your intro course incredibly fun, engaging, interesting, as well as rigorous and challenging. OK, I mean, there are just so many interesting things you can do with computer science. And computational concepts are part of something that everyone needs to know. There's no reason for it not to be that way. The second thing is we eliminated student macho behavior in the course. And oh, Chris, where are you, Chris? Uh, come on up. You're going to be my macho student. Uh, Chris was a graduate student at UBC while I was there. And I have never made him do this before, but I have made so many computer scientists do it. Come on up. OK. So um, how many? <laughs> You're going to love it. Um, how many of you have taken an intro class, CS class, at some point in your career? OK. So. How many of you had somebody in that course who seemed to know, usually male, usually somewhat geeky, not that I'm saying that you're somewhat geeky, but you know, <laughs> Nick, my husband, is definitely somewhat geeky, as is my son, Yannick, um, who seems to know more than the prof, because they're asking all the questions and they're answering all the questions. If you have seen this, raise your hand. Yes, it's pretty common. OK, so uh, Chris is in my intro class. And he is a fantastic student. I mean, he is just so passionate about computer science. He asks wonderful questions. He provides wonderful answers. But there's a problem. Because he's just so good that many of the other students in the class are intimidated because they assume that everybody, other than themselves personally, knows as much as he does. So I have this conversation with Chris. It's one-on-one um, -on -one and private, right? So I go, Chris, I love having you in my CS5 class. You really are just a fantastic student, and you're so passionate about computer science. Thank you. <laughs> and um, 
you know, uh, I was wondering, could we have, would you mind if we had our discussions about topics in office hours one-on-one? -on -one? Because the problem is that when you ask questions and answer so many questions, there's a few students who are feeling really intimidated. Would you be okay if we had those conversations, just one-on-one? -on -one? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> and it works. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for embarrassing you, Chris. And you might say, well, that's all very fine if you're doing it with a, a you know, course that only has, um, let's say, 40 students in it. Well, our intro CS class, we teach with 250 students. So it can either be the faculty member that does it, or it could be one of your TAs that has that conversation. But the most important thing is, number one, you're not... Chris is a really great student. He's not trying to intimidate. He's just enjoying his computer science class. And so you want to be really supportive of those students, but also you want to, and there's a lot of other things that you can check out on csteachingtips.org. It's put together by our faculty member, Colleen Lewis, that gives you a number of other ways that you can make sure that everyone in the classroom is feeling supported. Um, we took our first year female students to the Grace Hopper celebration of computing. We now take our, our uh, students of color to the Tapia uh, conference. And for four years, we provided summer research experiences for a handful, a handful being like actually two handfuls, about 10 students on socially relevant computer science research. Because we know that if we get students into uh, either work, uh, industry internships or uh, research experiences early in their time, whether it's students of color or female students, it increases their retention in the major. And so um, one of the reasons we were able to stop after four years, well, first of all, our grant run out, ran out, but by that time we were already at roughly 40% female, and so we felt like there was, an, there was enough of a community of female computer science students that it was no longer so necessary. The other thing we did was we talked to lots of companies, so Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Intel, LinkedIn, et cetera, to ask them to start early internship programs, so internships where they recruit students after their first or their second year in college. And now they all do that, and so there are more industry opportunities for them too. Okay, what about the intro course? Well, the old course, so, you know, to be accurate, the old course and the new course teach the same material. They teach the basic ideas of computer science. So the changes that I'm going to talk about are not changing the level of rigor of what you're learning. They're changing the way it's being framed and also the experience of taking the classes. Okay, old course, everybody talked about it as learning to program in Java. New course. Team-based creative problem solving in science and engineering using computational approaches in Python. Okay, let's just go through the team-based. That means it's not by yourself. Creative. Okay, every young person I know of wants to be, see themselves as creative. Problem solving. Well, we're science and engineering school, so yeah. Most people want to be able to solve problems if they're in science or engineering. Using computational approaches, we had to get the computer in there somehow in Python. Okay, so Python is an important choice. Um, you want to teach using a language that will enable students to get a summer job knowing that language. Java is a good choice. It's just that Java is less forgiving than Python. So if you're going to take your first and, and, you know, of the students that we teach in our introductory course, we teach typically about 600 students in that course. Um, about 60% of that are people who really have never programmed before. <coughs> now, some of those are from Harvey Mudd. It used to be a lot more than it is now. Now that all this great work of cs for all has been going on in the last few years, now many of our students come in having taken an APCS course. So they're actually uh, have programmed. But because we put all this effort into making it accessible and fun, for students without prior experience. Now we get gazillions of students from Scripps, Pitzer, CMC, and Pomona who are taking CS5 at Harvey Mudd because they can. 
So one of the things was um, we used to put them all in the same class. And we would have people who had taken two years of computer science at a college in the same class as people who'd never written a line of code. Now we group by prior experience. So CS5 Gold, either very little or no prior experience. CS5 Black, maybe an AP class. CS42, those were the kids who got way much, way too much computer science to be in an intro class. So they are taking the combination of CS5 and CS60, which is the next, which is our CS2, the second course in the sequence. And does anyone know why it's called 42? It's got to be some number between 5 and 60. Um, and then, as I mentioned, elimination of natural behavior. Now, one of the things we say is, independent of whether you're in CS5 gold or black, you'll be equally well prepared to take the second course in sequence to CS60. And finally, after I'd been giving this talk for a bunch of time, I gave it at UBC, and one of the uh, teaching faculty came up to me afterwards and he said, how do you make that work? How can you possibly take someone who's had like an APCS course and bring them to the same place after one semester as somebody who didn't have anything. And so I went back and I asked. And it's sort of obvious. So they, um, the students who are in CS5 Black have taken, they've probably seen half of the material in CS5. So they're going to spend roughly half of their time learning the other half of the material and then maybe 10% reviewing what they had seen before. OK, so that is going to leave 40% of the time to do something else. Well, so of course what they're going to do something super interesting, something super fun, just not anything that has any bearing on the next two courses in the sequence. So they could do steganography. They could do computer graphics. They could do all kinds of different interesting things. It's just that it's not going to privilege them for CS60 or 70, which are the next two courses. OK, so it became one of the most hated required courses to one of the most loved required courses just with this change. Um, we have roughly tripled our majors, which is a problem for you know, a president, uh, since uh, any institution that has tenure track faculty will know that uh, it's really awkward when all of a sudden all your students decide to go from one area to another. Um, but it's also meant that 80% uh, of the non-CS majors are now taking the second course in the sequence. More would do if, if they could get in. And more than 60% of the non-CS majors are actually taking the third course in the sequence. And again, more would do it if they could get in. So. Um, one of the things we try to do at Harvey Mudd is we try to be a lab for innovation in undergraduate STEM education. And then when we try to share what we discover that works with other places. So a few years ago, I was giving a talk much along these lines uh, to at Snowbird, which is the conference for computer science department chairs. Uh, uh, I guess it would be, so it is three years ago, so it would have been July 2014. And as I'm getting towards, you know, two-thirds of the way through the course, the talk, um, I, on the spur of the moment, decide to say, the first 10 department chairs that sign up to want to try these things in their own department, I will help you raise funds for getting your students to go to conferences like Hopper and Tapia. And Within two minutes, 15 department chairs signed up. And so, actually, I only knew about 11, because four of them went to my junk mail folder, and I didn't find them for a week. And within two days, I had raised money from Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. After I found the other four, I had to get money from Intel as well. And so this started the Braid Project, so I'll tell you more about it on the next slide. Um, Colleen Lewis, who has a Scratch course for to enable middle school or early high school teachers to teach a computer science course um, without necessarily having a lot of background. It's available in edX. I think 20 or 30,000 people have taken it so far. We offered an, also an edX uh, a MOOC for profs who would like to um, use the materials for our CS5 Gold class. 
And then we're also, one of the things that's really clear is we need to get way better at figuring out how to teach computer science for people who aren't computer science majors, because everybody's going to need it. So BRAID stands for Building, Recruiting, and Inclusion for Diversity. It's a collaboration by a whole bunch of uh, acronyms, uh, HMC, Anita Borg Institute, National Center for Women in Information Technology, Computing Research Association, Command It, which is the Center for Minorities and People with Disabilities in IT, and there are others involved as well. We have 15 computer science departments across the US, plus probably another 25 who are either the beacon departments who had already made progress and who are part of the cohort to help encourage these 15 departments to make progress. And then we've had so many other departments say that they want to be somehow associated, they're known as affiliates. Uh, it's funded by the usual suspects. And what's really different, and for this I have to thank Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft. He was the person I reached out to get funding from uh, right after the Snowbird Conference. And he said, Maria, put to get a research team that knows how to study this kind of thing and have them study what's going on in those departments from day one. And so I reached out to Jane Margolis, who was uh, together with Alan Fisher. They were the two people who led the effort at Carnegie Mellon back in the mid-90s. Uh, Jane said, I'm doing I'm completely consumed with Explore CS, which is uh, another one of the approaches to getting computer science into high schools. But she said, I've got this colleague, Dr. Linda Sachs, who would be amazing. So I did this phone call with Linda, and you, you, I've done some of these calls before, and you know, people who are not computer scientists are always wary of partnering with computer science folks because they are weird. So anyway, I'm on the full phone with Linda, and uh, fortunately I partnered with a lot of non-computer scientists before, so I sort of know about this. And in any case, she now has six graduate students, two post docs that are working on this. She got a huge grant from NSF. She's about to get some more grant money. And, and so we actually have this amazing study going on where they are doing longitudinal uh, research on students who take an intro course and study what they do after that, whether they choose to become majors or not, as well as a lot of other things. So increasing the visibility. We all need to take the responsibility. It's not just women and people of color who need to do this. We need to ask why there are so few women and people of color as faculty, as keynote speakers, summer interns, board members. And we need to talk about the importance of having diversity in tech. So one of the areas that's uh, had a lot of publicity in the last little while is, um, you know, uh, Uber, for example, uh, a variety of VCs. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for bad behavior going on in the tech industry and not a lot of I'd say success in actually addressing it. So I was asked to uh, join the board of the Alliance for Southern California Innovation. This is an effort to get more startups, more venture capital, more everything related to entrepreneurship into Southern California. And part of the reason for doing this is, so Southern California actually graduates more undergraduate engineers per square mile than any other area in this country. Who knew? I didn't know that. Uh, but you know, it's got five UC University of California campuses, and then it's also got Caltech and USC, plus the Claremont Colleges, plus various other kinds of Cal Poly Pomona, et cetera, Cal Poly Slow. So I got contacted by, well, I should say, first of all, the other reason for doing this is because Northern California is saturated. I mean, it's just the cost of housing in San Francisco and in Palo Alto and San Jose is, has skyrocketed. But even from the point of view of venture capitalists and, and startups, if you hire somebody, they will be poached 13 months later. And the salaries are just going up and up and up. And so the idea was, you know, there, so there's other startup communities, Seattle, uh, New York City, Austin, uh, Boston as examples, but um, none of those have sort of the California climate and lifestyle. And so the idea uh, was that it would be helpful since the cost of housing is roughly half 
uh, or even a third or a quarter of what it would be in the Bay Area, maybe we could actually attract more people um, to Southern California. So I was asked to join this board, and I'm pretty sure the reason I was asked was because they had looked at their list of board members, had about 20 people, and had exactly one woman. So they asked two women, myself and a Nobel laureate, uh, two days before the board meeting if we joined the board. And um, I've gotten smarter in my old age. So what I said was, unless you're passionate about diversity and inclusion, you do not want me. I will just make your life miserable. And so I got a call back the next day and said, we already have working groups on deal flow and IP. Would you lead a working group for us on diversity and inclusion? And I said, fine. Now, I know a lot about diversity and inclusion in higher education, particularly in STEM. I know quite a lot about uh, diversity and inclusion in large tech companies because I was on the boards of Microsoft and Broadcom for a number of years. Um, do I know a lot about diversity and inclusion in VCs and startups? No. So the first thing I had to do was try to uh, assemble a bunch of people who actually really knew about this. And I didn't want to do it just in Southern California because, um, you know, frankly, the people who know about this are spread all across the country. So I now have a working group of between 65 and 70 people. And um, this is not the first time I've done something crazy like this. It's like the fourth or something. But in any case, we had our first face-to-face -face meeting uh, with about 40 of the people there um, about a month ago. And we have come up with a number of initiatives, at least three of which we are working on. So the one I like best is um, so Probably everyone here knows about this thing about if you build a new building like this, for example. So what level of lead was this? Silver. Silver? OK. So you build a new building, either a corporate one or a university one, almost always these days you want to get it lead cer certified. So we have a commitment at Harvey Mudd as of I don't know when it was passed, but before I got there. Every building, new building we do, will be at least lead silver. And you can get lead gold if you typically are willing to spend a bit more money. And you can even, maybe I think there's a platinum level, but whatever. Silver is pretty good. It has totally transformed. These rankings, ratings have been out since the year 2000. It was started by a group that was actually organized by a Harvey Mudd alum named Malcolm Lewis who was on our board for 40 years, unfortunately died a couple of years ago of cancer. Um, they started this initiative, the US Green Building Council, um, and they were trying to figure out various kinds of ways um, that they could increase uh, sustainable practices in buildings. And they launched the LEED like ratings uh, in the year 2000. Our goal is to do something like that uh, for diversity and inclusion where companies and uh, organizations could apply for a bronze level or you know, gold, silver, whatever. And we are now ready for Q&A. And um, we have something really fun here. This is called a catch box. And if I throw it at someone and you catch it, then you have to ask a question. Does that sound like fun? So for those about, for those joining. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one of you's got to ask a question. For those joining on the telecast, it would be a good time to ask your questions via Twitter. We have someone monitoring the Twitter feed to ask those questions on your behalf. Go for it. Great. <laughs> okay. Well, fortunately, it doesn't matter whether you catch it or not. <laughs> That's why it's padded. Um, so our strategy was one intro class will not convince anyone who wasn't thinking about being a CS major to be a CS major. I guess I should walk away from that. Oh, well. 
Who knows? Um, so all we do is we try to convince you that you should take one more class. Okay, so it means that your second course in the sequence has to be really attractive as well. And then you try to get them to do a research or um, an internship the summer after the first year, and then to take the third course. So typically when they're in the third course, they're going like, oh, I like this, I could do this. So, um, and, and it's, we do it for everything. We do it for engineering, we do it for physics. It's this idea of trying to make your experience really engaging and supportive, building confidence and community, and getting you to the next stage. Okay. Well, it's going to be a problem if I can't throw it far enough. Okay, Eric. Oh, no, you can. Uh, when you split uh, the ENCO course into PS Gold, PS Black, and do I have to throw it back after the question? Or do you? Uh, did you require more? There you go. Oh, there's a mic in there. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Very high tech. Uh, did you have to add staff, two staff, to the uh, CS Gold, CS Black? all at once, that, uh, above what you used to have to, to teach the intro class in the old-fashioned way? Great question. So the answer is no, because uh, essentially what we decided was that we would, um, so we did put our, by far our best teachers and in the intro class, but that's because the best teachers in the department decided to work on the intro class. And in terms of the actual number of sections, didn't really change because we had been teaching and not having them all in the same room in any case. We just had to, you know, do the sectioning differently. Um, what I will say, however, is that because of the huge increase in the number of majors and in the number of students from the other campuses, we've had to, we've gone from a, a department of nine to a department of 15 over roughly a five-year period. So, and that's not nearly enough. It needs to be in the low 20s, but that's all I can afford at this moment. Follow-up? Yeah. How did you place people into these three classes? Oh, how do we place people into these three classes? So essentially what we do is we have, um, uh, we have a placement exam, but you're not forced. Um, you know, you can choose any of the ones, but the the placement exam gives us a chance to give students feedback on what is likely to be the best match. And so, um, but for example, we teach the three classes all at the same time of day. And so that means that if somebody starts out in black and really should have been in 42 or in gold, they can move. And, and you know, we see small amounts of movement. They can move within the first couple of weeks and there'll be no problem. Okay. Oh. I turned it on, but I don't think you guys can hear me. Yeah, let's switch. Okay, so I'm here. And what's live? Okay, that's live now. Okay, they switched it on me. So this is a question from Twitter from Duke Digital Initiatives. Someone from their audience asked, how can higher ed IT departments, so staff, work with their CS departments on diversity issues? Oh, that's a great question. So um, one of the things we've seen, so for example, we are going to offer our Girls Who Code um, uh, for the first time at Harvey Mudd. And that's a joint initiative between our IT department and our CS department. And also our IT department has been hiring lots of students to work with them both um, during the summer and uh, during the, actually part-time during the year. And so, I mean, one of the things we know is that access to work that actually uses the knowledge you've been learning is very reaffirming both for minorities, underrepresented minorities, and for women. And so they have really partnered to make that possible. And they've also, they've been working hard to also diversify their staff. Uh, and so I, I would say, um, the other thing I would say they've been doing is they've been um, really working hard to provide access to um, uh, large-scale computing resources. I mean, we're a tiny place, but there's lots of national access to the grid and other kinds of things. And so they've been really helping our faculty move 
into areas that would have been much harder if they, we didn't have that particular skilled support there. Oh, she's so much better. <laughs> All right, so uh, you talked about uh, C, uh, your first CS class, um, including that as a way to for the diversity. That suggests that your problem was mostly a retention problem and not an admission problem. If that's not true, what did you do for admission? Well, you know, we did a lot for admission because, you know, if if only a third of your students are female, the chances that you get a lot of female students in engineering and computer science is sort of low. And if almost none of your students are people of color, the chances that you get a lot of people of color in your classes are low. So um, we have done a variety of things for admission. So um, one of the things we had been doing for a long time was that we actually, for any admitted student who's female or a student of color, we will pay for them to come to the admitted student's day. Um, because we know that our yield in terms of the people who actually, I mean, remember we're competing with Caltech, MIT, Stanford, Berkeley. A lot of places are way better known than we are. And, and so one of the things we know, if we can actually get students on campus, our chance of actually recruiting them is much, much better. So we are already disproportionately uh, trying to boost our numbers by having women and, and people of color actually visit campus. We also run a number of programs in the fall called Fast Future Achievers in Science and Technology, where we bring uh, t two cohorts, uh, one in October and one in November, where we bring them for a weekend. And you know they arrive Thursday night. They're there Friday and Saturday, go home on Sunday. And we have them. They're hosted by Harvey Mudd students. They sit in some classes. Um, they just get a sense of the community, and that is very largely targeted at uh, uh, students of color uh, as well as female students. We have started something called WISDOM, which is Women in STEM, which is a program for roughly 20 uh, women of color whom we bring from across the country for a weekend in typically February. And then we have a, a monthly webinar with them, we assign them a mentor who's a, a MUD student, female student of color, who is in touch with them on a regular basis as a way, I, for a while we're seeing that our numbers of uh, Latinx male students and black male students was much higher than the Latinx female and black female students, and so we started this as a way to balance that. We've, we've seen that completely change just in the last little while. And the, the interesting thing is you impact a lot more than just the students you bring on campus because they go back and they talk about it. And so we also have a president scholars program uh, where we have roughly between eight and 12 students a year who receive full tuition for all four years. That's a, a diversity focused program where um, it's for people who are, will increase the diversity of the student body and who will be leaders among the students. And so it's open to white males and you know, to absolutely everyone. So for example, we've had farm boys. It's my example of we get very, very few students from uh, rural neighborhoods anywhere in the country. And so we've had uh, white male students uh, who fit that description. But most of the students in the President Scholars Program are students of color and uh, you know, tends to be at least half female. Um, for four years, I wrote a personal card to every admitted female student because we know that female students are more responsive to the personal touch. Um, I stopped doing it after four years because we had managed to raise the yield level for female students to be equivalent to the level for male students. Um, I could go on and on. Our faculty uh, contact every admitted student of color, every first gen student admitted, every low-income student admitted, and either phone them or email them or text them to encourage them uh, to consider the offer. I mean, it's it, everybody is involved in this. We make sure that every admission publication shows diverse student body, diverse faculty. We make sure that all of our tour guides and our actually admission counselors are diverse. I mean, it's, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> that we do at Harvey Mudd. Um, it's something that 
uh, has enormous support from our faculty and staff as well as the student body. And so we just try to make sure that everything we do is sending the message that we are doing as much as we can to make this an engaging, supportive climate for everyone. Now, are we an engaging, supportive climate for everyone? No. Because if you are in a transition like we're in, going from a, you know, a, an institution that was white and male for 30 years, half of our existence, there will be all kinds of traditions and habits that um, are not that inclusive. And so we're in this constant effort to figure out what those are and to address those. And so we get up every day and we say we're not perfect. We can be better tomorrow. We can even be better today. And that's a very helpful attitude because it means you don't have to feel guilty about the fact that you're not perfect. It's just that you're on a journey. And I remember my board chair a couple of years ago and saying, Maria, do we ever get there? And I said, of course not. I mean, the world is changing around us. It's always good. Challenges will always be there. But are we making progress? Absolutely. <laughs> there was a hand that way at the end. Hello. Um, so my question is, with a little background, I uh, spent this past summer at an organization where I worked on a team of 12 people, and none, none of them were women. Um, and so my question is, how do you begin to start those types of conversations when you're in a position of relatively little power, like an intern or just like an undergrad or something like that? So, great question. Um, one of our students was uh, doing an internship at a large, well-known company that starts with M. Um, <laughs> and um, they had managed to bring in a, a pretty diverse group of interns. And they had a spotlight series where uh, every week there would be a pretty successful tech person at Microsoft who would come and talk about their career path. And the MUD student, whose name is Teal, um, noticed that none of the speakers on the list were female. And so being Teal, she uh, went to talk to her manager and went to talk to her second level manager about this. And they went to talk to the organizers of the series. The organizers of the series uh, were very defensive and said, well, you know, we just didn't have women of this level of you know, success to profile. And Teal, having done her homework, had a list of 25 names. <laughs> well, you could have asked. <laughs> well, they added two women at the last moment. I mean, but she was really upset at the fact that they were so defensive and, you know, just not open to this. And so would the two managers. Okay, so Teal comes back and she's having lunch with one of our math professors, Talithia Williams, who is totally awesome. She's our first black woman to get tenure at the college. She's over the top amazing. She's one of the co-hosts of the Nova series. I mean, anyway, Talithia is fantastic. She tells Talithia the story and Talithia said, oh, did you tell Maria yet? And Teal said, no, until Talithia says, oh, you've got to go tell Maria. So she does. So I'm sitting with Teal, and um, I know, of course, the EVP for HR at Microsoft. And so I email her with Teal's uh, agreement. And I said, Kathleen, I'm sure that you don't know about this. Uh, and I, I think you, I'm also really sure you'd like to know about it. So, um, so I just briefly tell the story. And, you know, I hear back within two hours and, and she says, can you give me Teal's email address? And she did a phone call with Teal to apologize and I don't think that particular issue will happen again. So um, another story is about Fiona Tay who uh, just left Airbnb to go to another startup, but, you know, really was polite but persistent in asking these kinds of questions. So I, I would say the thing you have to do is, um, you first of all need to figure out who actually cares about it. Because if you're in an environment where, you know, people are just sort of making fun of the issues, 
it's probably not a good place to raise it. But you could have one-on-one -on -one conversations, particularly with the manager of your group, and sort of say, and say, you know, I'm just noticing I was, I'm in a group of, of 12 guys, and I'm wondering, you know, are you trying to, um, to recruit more women? Are there things that I could do to help to recruit more women? I have a bunch of uh, women in my classes here at NCSU who are really fantastic. I, I, it's usually better to offer support and help rather than criticism, which is, I mean, which is how Teal had started out in her situation. But sometimes you have to persist to the point of really being a nuisance. And, and that's one of the reasons that if I'm going to take on something at this point, I make it a point that I'll be a nuisance if they're not interested, so they might as well not have me. Speaking of being a nuisance, I'm afraid our time today is drawing to an end. So if we could thank our speaker. Mm -hmm.